Okay, we're going to get started with our next segment. It's going to be a really exciting one where we're going to get to know more about our students. So I'm going to hand it over to Karen Frostley Jones and Jimmy Ellis. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jimmy Ellis, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education. Um, part of what I do at the university is I lead our teams and groups that provide first year advising, teach our first year experience course, uh, do the academic support on our campus, everything from supplemental instruction to tutoring to math and stat lab, to our quantitative support, our writing center and so forth. And then I also support our department with the assessment and evaluation of those programs and also contribute and participate in campus conversations about retention and student success and things of that nature. Um, Karen Jones. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm Karen Frostley Jones. I'm the Assistant Provost for Institutional Research and Assessment. I try to explain to my relatives which that is, which is uh, we do research on the university itself. So it's everything from trying to understand student retention, why do students stay, why do students leave, surveys of uh, faculty and students about their experience, keeping the official statistics of the institution, how many students do we have, that kind of thing. So today we're going to go over a few items, just to kind of tip the iceberg stuff, even half an hour together. Just want to get you situated with some of the things that we observe, get conversations started, but also identify the two of us as people that you can contact, connect with additional questions, things of that nature. You know, first thing we're going to address is by the numbers, just give you a broad overview of AU's undergraduate and graduate population. Um, next is uh, uh, things we're finding from assess self assessments of students through surveying, other kind of outreach that we do with students. Um, both how students identify here at the university, but also how we differ from peer institutions. Um, we'll spend a little bit in just opening up some space to talking about the ways that students are experiencing challenge uh, and what are those opportunities for us to be able to support students from the lens of uh, the instructor community here at the university. And we'll draw some from um, survey information to guide that discussion. And then just briefly, we'll give you a big picture look at how retention is shaping up here at the university. So, so I'm going to tell you that we are going to go super fast through some of these first slides because we're going to send them to you and you're going to have these data. But we thought that it might be interesting for you to at least get a sense of, you know, what the numbers are, what our students are, what they're majoring in, et cetera. So we have um, just under 8,000 undergraduate students. We have about 4,000 master's students. Uh, we also have doctoral students, of course. Um, the thing that might be different from an institution that you have been to is that nine 97% of our undergraduates are full-time students. These are really, and, and many of these students, right, are living on campus. It's very different than some other institutions. Um, also, we see that about two-thirds of our students are, are women. Uh, where they come from, uh, we do have a lot of students who come from the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic, but we're increasingly seeing students come from the West Coast and also the South. Let me just go back one second and say, you'll notice an undergraduate that uh, not in the top five is District of Columbia. So we're still working on trying to get more students from our own uh, home area. And then in terms of countries, uh, it's overwhelmingly students from China. We do have a program on campus that you're probably aware about, aware of that students can come to AU as non-credit or non-degree students, really beef up their language skills before they go on and become uh, degree-seeking matriculated students. In terms of race ethnicity, about 56% of our students identify as white at the undergraduate level. You'll notice that at the at this level, about 7% of our students identify as black or African American, but at the master's degree level, that doubles to 14%. And uh, about 45% of our undergraduate master or our graduate master students identify um, as white. The majors. So we, pro I know we have people from all different schools and colleges here teaching all kinds of different things. Uh, for many years, the School of International Service was the largest school. Now it's right in the pack with um, the School of Public Affairs, the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, all of our schools have a lot of popular majors. The most popular one is International Studies. Almost 1,500 students here major in that, which is very different than what you might find um, at other institutions. But the thing that we are really proud of is that we have a lot of fast growing majors in the sciences. So while our chemistry program, our biochemistry, those programs 
might be relatively small compared to an institution that you might have been to. Those are programs that are growing uh, fast. And at the master's level, we have some online and face-to-face -face, uh, programs. And those programs also have a lot of diversity in terms of what's popular. Um, our undergraduate is very selective. Uh, this year, it was a 44% admit rate with a SAT score of 1359, although our SATs are is a test optional institution, so not everyone um, takes the test. Uh, right now, as of a few days ago, we had 1822 first-time freshmen. That's going to go up uh, a little bit, and virtually all of those students, maybe with the exception of a few, live, live on campus. Um, so attitudes, did you want to do this part? You can okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to share with you some data that kind of gives you a sense of what students are like. So you may have heard of a um, survey out of UCA, UCLA called the Higher Education Research Institute Survey, or HARI, which I would have called it something else. But um, so we asked, we're no longer doing that survey, but we asked some similar questions on the summer transition survey. And what we find is that our students are really different than some other students. Keeping up to date with political affairs, uh, over three fourths of our students say that's very important or essential compared to, and it's gone down nationally, but 57% in 2018, about again, three quarters saying influencing the social, social values was important. And and uh, becoming a community leader is also important for our students. Okay, Jimmy. Yep. 2022 uh, national or was that AU's number? Uh, the number for 2022 is um, AU's number. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and what I've seen in some of the national numbers, so just clearly dark blue is our summer transition survey, asks the exact same question as the Harry survey. The light blue is what our answers were in 2018. And the orange is what the answers were for our peers, um, for other private institutions in 2018. All right, so moving forward here, we're gonna slow down just a bit and um, spend some time with what we're learning about students, kind of big picture, but also some of the things that Karen and team are, are identifying in the various assessments and surveys that we have. Um, you know, thinking big picture, when we think about the challenges and opportunities of students that are faced, that they're facing um, nowadays, some big um, high level areas are issues of adjustment, difference between students from different backgrounds, high stress levels, passion for engagement, um, and both the positive and the negative that passion might um, uh, create for students and this need for connections. Um, we see this in the national um, conversation about how students are um, experiencing university and, 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 and um, their development, but also we're seeing this here, uh, here at AU as well. You know, some specifics that uh, colleagues around campus have been talking about the last few months is thinking about um, uh, the external versus internal locus of control that students uh, that we're encountering, that students more and more are coming to us clearly with a sense of uh, an external locus of control, that exceedingly we're finding students that when they interact with us are positioning themselves as less empowered um, in many ways. Uh, these are students that when something goes wrong will attribute it to things that are happening around and to them um, and then less so be willing to um, say, hey, what can I do and have that agency? And I think, you know, being alongside students and ourselves, we understand why some of that might be true, uh, but we are encountering that quite a bit. And so those conversations, I think understanding that students are having that orientation, I know for me, um, it went against and when in contrast to how I experienced college and went through that problem solving process, it was much more internally locus control focused. But for our students, it's a little bit different. Um, how it sounds like to me sometimes when I work with students is a sense of defeatism, um, like that, that there's nothing that can be done. Um, and so when I'm working with students, trying to build up that confidence and showing them where they have agency and ability to move forward is a key thing that I try to contribute when I work with, um, with, our, with our students. Something else that we're seeing related to this on our campus is students are coming to us uh, with less healthy habits, uh, in particular around a few key areas. One is sleep. Um, our students are telling us, we're observing that students' health habits when it comes to sleep is are deteriorating. Um, and that has an effect on how they're showing up into our classroom spaces when they're with their peers and living a, a room, uh, living assignments and things of that nature. Another place is um, physical health and wellness. 
um, that because a lot of their attention and focus is in those online spaces and communities and they manage such a, I think, productive at times online experience, that what can come at a cost is that of investment in their physical health and well wellness and well-being. And then because we draw from all over the country and world, especially for new students, some of the inherent protective factors and routines and rhythms they had to at least achieve some health, um, health, uh, health and wellness, to achieve some um, um, a level of a kind of sleep, uh, healthy sleep habits, those can fall apart pretty quickly because they're coming from far away to come to this new environment. And the last one is uh, noticing that students are having much different preferences in how they want to communicate with one another. Um, that oftentimes coming to a place like our university, there's an expectation that in a classroom, in a social environment, that students will be very willing and able to engage each other one-to-one, -one, face to face, person to person. What we're finding is that sometimes the preference is to do that electronically via text, via online, things of that nature. And so there is a kind of a steep learning curve for students to be able to engage effectively, I think, in um, in class uh, classroom environments. And so something to keep in mind that you know, what's the way to balance, you know, students need for these kind of things, ways that we can maybe understand that and adjust our behavior and practice with students, but then also to draw them forward to healthier habits, draw them forward to different ways of communication is something that is on our minds. Um, some big picture kind of things that we have assessed and evaluated, just want to give you just a very descriptive look at is Looking at first year students and their summer transition survey, this is a survey that we offer to students right before they arrive to the university. Um, we find that about 44% of our students are responding on the higher end of the scale, a one to five scale, extremely or very, on to what degree do you feel anxious about college? So nearly half of our students are feeling um, uh, very or extremely anxious about that. And then for this question, how likely are you to seek out academic support if needed? Um, I like seeing this, that about two thirds of our students are saying that if I encounter some academic struggle or issue, um, I will be willing to seek out that support. What I like that for you is that you should feel comfortable making that recommendation to students, is that if you encounter a student that looks like they're struggling, you're um, that's in a community of students that is willing to take that step. That's also in a community of students that's unlikely to um, show you proactively that they're struggling. There's a keeping up of appearances on our campus where um, when students look to the left and to the right, they get a sense that no one is struggling in this kind of way. But we know that students do. And in fact, when I ask first year students about if they're struggling at least one or, or more classes, about 60% of students at week five are saying they're struggling at least one class and 40% are struggling two or more. But to each other, it doesn't feel that way. And so the extent that we can, as an academic community, draw that from them and normalize that, I think it'll go a long, for, a long way for our students and just their um, ability to do well at, on, um, on our campus. Um, some other notes that I just wanted to share is that here, it's from, drawing from that same survey from last year from our first year students, um, these are students and their attitudes and outlooks and their confidence. Um, so taking class exams, um, interestingly for these students, about 23% um, um, uh, say that they're um, confident about taking exams in class. Uh, Participating in class, this uh, willingness to participate in, in a classroom environment, about half are feeling strongly about that. And then keeping up with uh, the work in your classes, about half are feeling confident about that coming through the front door. Now, understandably, this is without a lot of information, you know, so this is them assessing and evaluating who they were as students coming in. And then in anticipation of their first year, this, these are attitudes that we're seeing. So this is what you might encounter uh, in your classrooms. Now, this one about taking exams, that's an interesting one. You would imagine that potentially our students would be more confident, but I think this um, contributes, or this is can be attributed to, I think, um, anxiety and worry about taking exams that even though they might perform very well, and maybe they have a history of doing it, I think that there is a socialization around exams and that sort of evaluation that our students are, I think some students are apprehensive about. So there's that. Let me switch gears to you. Yeah. No, no problem. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the National Survey of Student Engagement. This is a survey that is done of first year students and senior students. So in this uh, one, it's first year students. And what it shows you is how AU, we last did it in 2018. We did it again this past spring. We just got the comparison data back literally 
basically no one has seen it yet, but I'm going to tell you about it. So, um, but what this shows, uh, I think, is that there are some really big differences between AU's experience and what the culture is here at AU versus some other institutions. The two comparisons are private not-for-profit research institutions, and then all institutions that would include liberal arts institutions, you know, master's institutions, et cetera. And what you'll see that on the question, um, how often, very often or often, did you connect your learning to societal problems or issues? Um, that was 77% in 2018. It's showing at 82% this past spring. Um, at in 2018, that was a big gap between AU and other institutions. That gap, you know, I can I didn't put it on the slide because I literally just got the 23 information. That gap is even bigger now. Um, AU students really experience that. Examine the strengths and weaknesses of your own views on a topic is still strong. Included diverse perspectives, um, very strong. And these are what students are experiencing and expecting here at AU. Um, this is the number for seniors, which is also um, quite a big difference between um, AU and our peer institutions. However, you know, Jimmy was talking about this uh, student to student relationship, and we sort of put as a flag out there or something for you to consider um, the answers to these questions. So did they often or very often ask another student to help you understand course material, um, explain course material to one or more students? Um, were they involved in preparing for exams by discussing or working through course material with other students? This is an area where students are actually less likely to do it here at AU. It gets to Jimmy's discussion about, you know, the independence that students have and how they sometimes approach things. And quite frankly, on the, you know, some of the questions here in Nessie about student to student relationships, we really have some opportunities to um, improve that at the institution. Um, and then uh, there's questions about diverse others. This is again a situation where students are likely to have um, experiences very often or often related to race, ethnicity, um, economic background, and religious beliefs. Um, it, I thought it was interesting to see what's happened to the question of having um, these discussions with people with political views other than your own. And AU has always been lower. Um, you know, this is a political institution, right? <laughs> It's, it's always been lower than other institutions, but it went from 49% agreeing to that in 2018 to 36% saying that in um, 2023. I haven't looked yet to see if it went down nationally, but it, it's quite possible it also went down nationally, but it speaks to a climate that we have in our campus. And also there are quite a few um, conservative students on campus. Um, those students sometimes really do feel displaced and um, not having a voice. Yeah, at a very high level, just wanted to share some overall retention rates. Uh, you know, retention at a university is measured uh, by a defined incoming cohort. What's their enrollment in time one, which is in, they're entering fall, to a second time, which is their second fall. Um, the blue columns represent our one-year retention rate over the years, and you see that over the years, it's ranged from, you know, 84.8 to 90.5%. Um, if you ask me to average that out, it's kind of in that 86 to 87, 88% these last five years. Uh, and then the uh, the orange column uh, represents a one to three year rate. So it's a cumulative. So it's uh, from the first fall to the third fall, a two year retention rate. And you see that that has averaged um, anywhere between the high 70s to, um, to low 80s over that same time period. Um, now, for our students, you know, these retention rates are describing not their absolute um, progression uh, in higher education. Uh, the reality is, is that when students leave AU, based on our clearinghouse data that we track and can see, they are pursuing their education elsewhere. And so these aren't stopouts that we're seeing. These are students that often, uh, nearly most of them, are, are, are transferring to another institution. Uh, and so just wanted to give that context as well. And then um, a survey that we ask uh, after the summer transition survey is a fall transition survey. We offer this survey to students between weeks four and six of their first semester. This is a survey that has a high response rate. It's kind of 70 to 80% based on the year. And over the past few years, um, we've been asking these questions here, you know, just around their academic experience. One is, are you finding your courses interesting? And here what I'm showing you is, uh, how did students that return to AU 
there next year compared to those students who left AU that next year. And here I'm giving you the proportion of students who answered high on that scale. On the first question, you see there's about a 16 point difference between um, uh, founding courses interesting. If you go down to the, the third one, do you feel like AU is a place where you belong? Uh, there we see a 31 point difference between students who ended up coming back to university versus those that left. And in the middle, professors care about you. I guess we could talk about a consistency of experience and approach. You know, whether a student left or stayed, we're seeing that that that, that sense of care to students um, was was pretty equivalent. And that makes sense to me in some ways because a lot of times, as faculty, especially early on, you don't have a lot of information about whether a student's going to come or go. And I think you're trying to appeal to the best parts of that student and to see that consistency. I think is affirming of a, a practice that I feel on our campus. Now, when you look at the um, the students who return. What's interesting for me, just from a qualitative standpoint, is that those numbers are kind of, for me, relatively low overall. So we, we can celebrate that 59% of returning students felt that way, but then still there's that near 40 point gap of students who after just five weeks on our campus aren't indicating to us a four or a five on that scale. And so sometimes we look at differences, but I'm also looking at the absolutes. The absolutes, I think, um, something that we can work on as a community is what was it look like to raise that line overall? You know, how does that look like and, and have students feel comfortable and willing to describe AU as a place where they belong at even a higher rate overall is an opportunity that I think um, um, I, I want to get involved and engaged with. And then just a little bit more on this belonging question. Um, just last year, I was curious about this belonging question. It was showing up in a lot of different analysis that I was doing. I was finding interesting things about it, but I didn't know a lot about what students were thinking about when they were answering the question the way that they did. And so just in a purely exploratory fashion, I also asked four additional questions that I think related um, in some way to the belonging question. And it's also feedback that I got from the campus of, hey, I, we think that some of belonging relates to this. And so this is what I put here. And so for students that answered highly on this question of four or five, last year there was about 650 students that answered that way from this survey. What I'm going to show you now is the percentage of students who also answered highly on, a, on four questions um, uh, that I asked uniquely last year. So one is my experience with AU aligns with how AU promotes itself. If you answered highly on that last year, you also answered highly to this one about 66% of the time. The next one is being an AU student means a lot to me. Again, if you answered highly on that question, about two thirds of the time, you also answered highly on this question. Here, 78%, I have someone at AU that cares a lot about me. If you answer highly on that belonging question, you 78% of students also answered highly on this question about someone at AU that cares a lot about them. And on this question, we've had a long running question where at the end of the survey, we asked students if they can identify someone um, who um, has helped them be successful in their first semester. And uh, we we, um, we have that information by staff, faculty, student, peer, and then to the best we can, we try to get out to um, folks with a thank you, you know, just kind of broad that you've been identified as someone that um, uh, was mentioned on this survey. And then the last one was, I can see a bright future for myself at AU. So if a student answered a four or five on that belonging question, 92% of those students also answered a four or five. They can see a bright future for themselves at AU. And again, we're asking this question five weeks into their first semester. And so there's some heavy determination evaluation I think students are, are making overall. We happening to, we're happening to ask them about a few of those things. Um, and this is some of what we see. Now, if students answered low on the belonging question, you know, one or a two or a three or lower, um, what do we see? Well, so for the one about the experience with AU Alliance, only about a quarter answered highly on that question. That's what they're saying. So if you answered a one, two, or three on the belonging question, what percentage answered highly on the uh, these one of these four questions? Only a quarter did for the one about AU aligning itself with how it promotes itself. Only about a fifth said that being an AU student means a lot to them. 40% said there's someone at AU that cares a lot about me. So I like that, that, that that's, we control that, right? To try to um, create an environment where students are around these kind of relationships. So that's a little bit higher. And then um, at that week five mark, if you answered a one, two or three in the belonging question, uh, only about 40% of students said that they saw a bright future for themselves at AU at that time. 
Um, this is a question that if a student answers a five on this question, the return rate the next year is over 95%. A four was about 92, 93%, and then it scales down from there to a one being quite low. Um, uh, and a three or two and a three being in that high 70 to low 80 range. So quite a, a big difference in eventual uh, enrollment for the next year. Okay, so there's that. I can see that we've basically kind of run out of time, but we um, welcome any questions you might have or, you know, just use these questions as food for thought as you're going about planning your courses and thinking about what your role might be in helping students belong and helping students uh, be successful. Um, but we probably have time for one question at least. I think as many as you allow us to have. <laughs> Everybody's set. Anything surprising to you? This might be a data point coming from outside of your department, but how do you get a view into like the social life of students? Um, just how their friends are going, what their experience is, and sort of compare that qualitative experience with this data. Great question. I'm going to have Jimmy answer that because the fall transition survey does get at some of their social experiences. So, yeah, I mean, that's so what we have is um, a, a pretty, like, not a pretty routine and regular uh, evaluation of students for them to self assess how things are going. And we try to do that uh, consistently from year to year and then across years as well. And so we have that in reflection, that moment of time. And so it allows us to initiate and have conversations with colleagues about, are you seeing similar things? And with students themselves, if they're seeing similar things. Now, does AU have, I think, a mature ability to be able to collect qualitatively and anecdotally the perceptions and attitudes of students and almost like a pulse in a sense? Like that's something that is in conversation and it's a maturing topic and idea that, I mean, with a lot of credit to Karen, Karen is thinking about ways to be able to, to get that, to get that temperature of the campus of students and to be able to do that in a more routine and regular way versus the systematic kind of moments in time, which often are just snapshots and not necessarily getting at the fabric of how students are doing. Anything you'd add? Well, the only thing I'll add is that when we do look at retention and the causes of students leaving, it's as likely to be the social as it is to be the academic. And in fact, probably more likely to be the social than the academic. So the student to student relationships that you see within your classroom are, are important. They're important to the students' um, academic progress as much as they are you know, social. So it's really important when you can to help students develop those positive relationships in the classroom. It does make a difference. Thank you so much for coming. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, everybody.